wanted to share some today about uh, the great matter, you know, why we practice, the deepest level of practice, you know, for Zen, the great matter, which is the question of life and death. Yeah, I know quite a few of you uh, who were present at the, the retreat this past weekend. How, how many were at the retreat this weekend? Okay, so most of you here were, and uh, several online, I think, were also present at the retreat. Mm. The work we do in the retreat is r really the opportunity to go deep with our practice. Uh, daily practice is essential to maintain awareness, um, but it does take extended practice periods with a group that's in, intentional about deep practice to really go deep. And then you go and you plumb the depths of yourself and you make discoveries and you have releases in that context and then you bring that forth out into your everyday activity, your normal routines and things have shifted. And then you can take those learnings forward and then your conditioning comes back in slowly and then you do it again and you go deeper and deeper and every time, every time is another deepening, another excavation, tilling the ground of what has become a thickened set of conditioning within your body mind, you know, starts to become loose and fertile, fertile ground for you to work with and your fixations start to loosen. <clears throat> and that's what's at the heart of our suffering. It's at the heart of the human condition that the Dharma is addressing. It's this fixations that we have, subconscious fixations on who we are. <clears throat> it's at the root of what most of us are seeking in the Dharma. It really is that question of who am I? And that is the question of life and death. We understand life and death in a certain way. And it's, and it's a um, mistaken way. It's an ignorant way. It's deluded. And our understanding of ourself as something that can die and that has a body is a delusion which is right at the heart of the suffering that we cause for ourselves and others. <clears throat> and it takes going into that um, intensified environment of the retreat to support us in deconditioning ourselves from the conditioned mind that holds us in its sway. We need that. There's an edge when we come to retreat, you know, there's an edge where we've got some fear, you know, can often come up and sometimes, especially early in practice, it's, you know, can I make it physically through this? And then we start to see that we come up against really uncomfortable um, emotional states in retreat or we can. And then that is something that can create resistance in us. That's how, how tightly we hold on to our, the familiar, the unknown, the instability of the true openness of who we are is scary. But this is the, really the great matter to resolve in our practice. You know, it's not about creating more, a more comfortable mindset for ourselves. It's about really actualizing the truth of who you are at the biggest level. Uh, I, I talked about Lehman Pong for a couple of my last few talks 
and one of the beauties of uh, the example of Lei Min Pong, Lei Family Pong, is uh, that they were lay practitioners. You know, they weren't in the rarefied environment of the monastery. And that's much more like our lives than all these monastics in the tradition. So it's such a living example for us. And Lei Min Pong is a very highly realized, all of the lay family very highly realized. And I, I, and I want to emphasize that part of it because I didn't emphasize that part of it in my last two talks. He, he did practice in a monastery for two years with uh, Basso before deciding, you know, the monastic life wasn't for him. Studied the sutras deeply before deciding that sutra study wasn't the thing for him. And then he went off and Ling Chao, his daughter, never as far as we know, entered any kind of formal, you know, environment, practice environment, but she was profoundly awakened. <clears throat> so I wanted to share the death experiences of uh, both Layman Pong and, and his daughter, just to bring forth the, the power of his realization. So Layman Pong was about to die, and he spoke to his daughter, Ling Chao, saying, see how high the sun is, and report to me when it's noon. Ling Chao quickly reported, so she went to the window. The sun has already reached the zenith and there's an eclipse. So the layman went to the door to look out. He, she had intrigued him. Ling Chao seated herself in her father's chair and putting her palms together reverently, passed away. The layman smiled and said, my daughter has anticipated me. And then he postponed his going for seven days. The prefect UT came to inquire about his illness. The layman said to him, I beg you just to regard as empty all that is existent and to beware of taking as real all that is non-existent. Fare you well in the world, all is like shadows and echoes. His words ended, he pillowed his head on Mr. Yu's knee and died. There's a similar story from the tradition. Um, Tozan, Master Tozan, quite sure it's Tozan, um, was ill for a long period of time and then uh, was coming up to his, what he knew to be his death. And he was sitting in Zazen in front of his monastery and he passed away in Zazen. And all of his students, all of the monks in the monastery started wailing and crying and being very sad. And, and he uh, came back to life. <laughs> 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 and, and he said, ah, oh, you, you, you people, uh, I, I, I just remembered this. I didn't look it up beforehand. Uh, so I don't have the quote, but something to the effect of, you know, haven't you learned? Haven't I taught you? Haven't you learned what the great matter is? So he um, made a dinner for everyone <laughs> that <laughs> night that he called the idiot's dinner. <laughs> and he served everyone. And if I'm remembering right, um, he also stayed alive for another week. And then he passed away. <laughs> Obviously, with the same, you know, message that he wanted to convey, don't, don't hold on to what's unreal. Okay. Now, this is, there, there's something a little bit perhaps harsh about this, you know. These are monks dedicated, you know, to this. And he really wants them to see the great matter of life and death. That's what they're... That's what they're dedicated to, and that's what his role is dedicated to, helping them see that. So don't take this to mean you shouldn't grieve. Take this contextually, right? And another, you always should grieve. We can always grieve. But this was a, 
This was a teaching moment. <laughs> this was a powerful teaching moment for him to give one last lesson in human form to his students. A great matter. What do we do? We fixate on the self as something independent, separate, and kind of unchanging. <clears throat> There's a story of the seven wise sisters. Seven wise women, sisters. Sorry about that. Uh, who are supposed to have lived around the time of Shakyamuni. They were of noble birth, aristocrats, and as was customary among the wealthy, they were surrounded by servants who took care of them. All they needed to do, much like the Buddha before he became a wandering mendicant, was entertain themselves. They liked to go to parties and have fun. According to the story, one day the eldest of the women say, today, instead of going to a party, let's go to the crematorium or let's go to the Nirvana forest. So they did. When they got there, they saw a corpse. The eldest sister pointed to it and said, the corpse is here, where has the person gone? At that, all seven women are said to have experienced enlightenment and realized the way. At that moment, a shower of flowers came down from heaven and a voice said, excellent, excellent. The eldest sister asked, who is praising us? And the voice from the sky said, I'm Indra, and because I've seen the sacred women realizing the way, I came and scattered a rain of flowers. Indra is actually a Hindu deity, but has been co-opted into Buddhism. <clears throat> so then Indra says, So the um, Indra offers them with the power of their Dharma uh, to give them whatever they would like. He gives them anything they want. And the eldest sister asks for three things, a rootless tree, a piece of land with no north and south, and an echoless valley. So right from the beginning, the question, you know, this is the, the root koan. Here's the corpse. Where did the person go? Right there, there's a separation, isn't there? We've got the body and we've got the person. This is how we see ourselves. This is our internalized way of seeing ourselves. We're a person with a body. And we have this understanding, we even have this question, where did that person go? Right in the question is the understanding that something was here in a certain way and now has gone. It's just the way that we think about things. It's so embedded within our consciousness to see ourselves as, as subjects and see our sense experience as objects. Other people, thoughts, shapes, forms. It's right at the root of our understanding. Right at the core of Buddhist Dharma is that this is a delusive and ignorant understanding of what's going on. So the rootless tree. Yeah, so we think in terms of the root and then the trunk and then the leaves. Right. 
right? We're kind of breaking the thing up into parts. The conditioned mind thinks in that way. The piece of land without north and south. Well, every piece of land has a north and south, you could say. But if the piece of land is the entire universe, where's north and where's south? Or the echoless valley. You need two sides to have an echo. The problem is that we live within these echoes. And that we only understand the echoes as being reality. And not the primary experience. Not the, not the source sound, the source energy, the source perception. So our practice is to return again and again and again to that source experience, right? We can't, with our minds, look for the echoless valley. We can't, with our minds, discover where the person goes. It has to come from an intimate examination of who you are. It's the only way. Who you are. And that means returning again and again and again and again, moment by moment by moment by moment turning the light inward to see what is manifesting within your body and mind. We have this line from Dogen that everybody knows to study the Buddha way is to study the self, to study the self is to forget the self and to forget the self is to be awakened by the 10,000 things. In Appreciate Your Life, Mazumi Rishi brings out that the word for study that Dogen uses, it isn't study um, in the sense of you study and you learn something, right? Because that's, there's, there's separation there. I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna take on something I've learned. I, now I have no, more, more, more knowledge, right? Or, or meaning, I've discovered some meaning. It isn't that, it's study a more literal translation of that is to do something over and over. So you could say practice. So to practice Buddhism is to practice your life. To practice Buddhism, practice your life. Practicing your life is to live your life moment to moment over and over and over again. So to do that in a way that pulls you so far inside of yourself that you're no longer a person doing what you're doing. You've gone inside the self-consciousness. <laughs> and it's, when we're doing Shikantaza or we're doing breath practice or we're doing um, koan practice. And if we have that thought that come up, I'm doing shikantaza or I'm doing koan, I'm doing breath, with it, which we all have, right? Then you're not doing shikantaza anymore. <laughs> that's, that's it. So we practice the shikantaza and when that self-consciousness goes away, then we become the single point where the single point is the whole universe. Because it is the notion of the self, the personal experience, personalized as you, and gets in the way of you seeing your true nature. <clears throat> and when we have resolution 
you know, on the great matter. See, we don't, we don't answer it. You don't get an answer to it because if there's an answer, then it's separate from you and it's something you can get, but it's nothing you can get that you don't have already. <laughs> so all it is is seeing who you truly are now. Your, your intrinsically awakened nature, your intrinsically non-separate nature. And when you have some resolution to this, in deep, shallow, all the other questions in your life just completely shift. They're energetic. Who to be in a relationship, who to marry, the job to take, where to live, how to raise your kids. Totally shift. When we address these questions from the place of the person, the personhood, and the personal, it's so difficult. It's so difficult. And also, based on a fundamental misunderstanding of who you are. So there's, there's all sorts of, you know, good, good guidance and wisdom around all of that. I'm not saying there isn't, there is. But to resolve the root, the great matter, then those become almost like a play. <laughs> it's like a game. Oh, I'll try this. I'll do that. I'll do my best here. Here I am getting angry again. You know, the fixation on having things go the right way for me. Mm, so much energy is going into that. And then it gets released into the play of life. Uh, there's, there's a story from the life of Ramana Maharshi and Papaji, who was a student of his and then became a big guru after that, um, that, that really struck me. And it was a, it's on a video on YouTube and it was told by a British guy who was a student of Ramana Maharshi's for decades. And I think actually observed this conversation with Papaji, who was one of his students. And he had uh, Papaji, wasn't called Papaji at the time, um, just had had a huge realization with Ramana Maharshi and just wanted to spend the rest of his life just in devotion in Ramana's ashram. And his, um, his family was caught in the partition of Pakistan from India. So this must have been in the late 40s. And as you know, as, as I think everybody knows, there was horrific violence there. The Muslims and Hindus, you know, battled over boundary lines and, and communities. And so his family was caught on the Pakistani side of the border and, and they were asking him to come and help them, you know, get back into India. And uh, Papaji didn't want to go. He said, no, you know, all that's just uh, ephemeral. <laughs> it's just the drama of life. You know, I just want to be here and, and devote myself to the sacred. And Rama Maharshi apparently said, oh, no, before he said, he said, that's all a dream, right? That's all a dream. So that sounds like Lehman Pong's last words, right? Don't take as real what's unreal. And we do say, yeah, life is a dream. So it is a dream in Papaji's life. No, it's just a dream. I want to be here in what's real. And, and Maharshi said to him, Ramana said to him, don't fear the dream. <laughs> don't fear the dream. Go take care of your family. This has really helped me in the last few years <laughs> as, I, as I jumped into family life. <laughs> and with some regularity, <laughs> God, I wish I could just be practicing more and being in the Zendo and going to retreat and like not like dealing with all this 
drama. In me too, I'm not saying I'm above it in any way. I'm just like in it, triggered left and right. But when I tell myself, don't, don't fear the dream, just do some lucid dreaming here <laughs> in the midst of this. It's, it's, a, it's a great practice. Yeah, and I'm very grateful that I've been able to do, you know, a lot of formal practice in retreats every month for decades to do that. Because I know I, I would be struggling much more. I'd be struggling. I, I, I actually, I can say I'm not even really struggling. That doesn't mean it's not hard, but it's not really a struggle. I'm not struggling with myself. So I'm very grateful for that. <clears throat> and that's kind of where I started. It's just the, the importance of doing deep practice to really look intimately into who you are. Every moment is an opportunity to do that. Maintain consciousness of that. And then slowly, slowly, and then quickly, 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 then slowly, then slowly, then quickly. The fixation on the condition, the understanding drops away. And you see through it. And then you just practice your life in every moment. That's a, that's the way to practice in Zen. Yeah. You take care of that. It takes care of you. Okay, well, thank you for your attention.